going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. I'm Pat Soldano, president of Family Enterprise USA. We advocate for generationally owned family businesses and their lifetime of savings at a national level in Washington, D.C. We represent all sizes of business, small, medium, and large, and all industries. We advocate for those issues and concerns of the families of family businesses. So I'm very pleased today to have the topic of Corporate Transparency Act, the rationale, key considerations for family businesses and what comes next. And our speaker is Matt Brown, who we've had before. And the Brown and Straza is a sponsor of Family Enterprise USA. We really appreciate their sponsorship. Matt Brown is a partner with the Orange County, uh, California office of Brown and Straza. And he heads up the firm's tax trust and estates group and its ultra high net worth subgroup. So he also represents family business owners and philanthropists in personal planning, business succession, and charitable planning. So welcome, Matt. Well, thanks, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, let's jump in and uh, we've got a chat going so people can ask questions as we go. We'll leave some time for questions at the end as well. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of detail here. My hope is to make it uh, give you a little bit of flavor uh, with the background of why uh, why we're here, why does the CTA exist, why was it passed, the Corporate Transparency Act, the, the purpose, uh, can I do this myself? Um, some of the definitions, methodology, a few examples, um, <clears throat> and then we'll touch on rules specific to trusts and to trustees, uh, and then kind of round out at the end with some uh, a little detail on inheritance, nonprofits, some key due dates, and um, uh, some other administrative items that people might want to uh, keep an eye on. So here's a a list of the the topical uh, information we want to get to. So um, this was a really challenging law to get attorneys uh, and other professionals to really pay attention to. It was pending for a while. We had regulations. Uh, introduced, and there were hopes, dreams, aspirations, whatever, that the regulations would be delayed or the effective date of the regulations would be delayed, but um, uh, that did not happen. And so January 1st of 2024, um, we were able to start reporting um, to the to FinCEN uh, related to Corporate Transparency Act uh, disclosure. And so this was something I was hoping to never have to learn about. Also, that's not all that exciting, um, although the, the, some of the, the motivation behind it is, is really interesting. Um, uh, but I decided to write some presentations and go out and speak to bar associations and other professionals because I thought, well, um, I see a lot of other people who aren't real excited about this, but people have got to figure it out so they can serve their clients. So we're... Uh, uh, call it what you will, you know, Brussels sprouts, spinach, broccoli, we're uh, kale. This is, um, you know, some tough stuff to uh, to digest, um, but we've, it's good for us, I guess. Um, since it's here, we got to figure out how to comply with it uh, and help our clients comply with it. So we have really two options, especially on the professional side, we can master the issues or bury our head in the sand. Um, issue number two or approach number two is probably not ideal. We'll talk through some of the the challenges, but why do we have this Corporate Transparency Act? What is the background behind it? Um, and I, I, I can't say this is true as much as uh, the perception, um, but the perception by the government, uh, by the regulatory agencies, by Congress, is that the United States is facing a systemic risk because uh, of our reputation as really a top jurisdiction for money laundering and evasion of foreign tra foreign taxes. So uh, sitting in the U.S., we probably hear about people taking money offshore to um, some exotic locale, and we think, oh, gosh, I can't believe it. It's so fraudulent. Well, the reality is the United States um, and jurisdiction states within the United States facilitate all kinds of uh, money laundering, uh, tax evasion of foreign taxes, et cetera. Um, we are a much more private society than, uh, than some others. We value our privacy, privacy more highly. We might be a little bit more independently minded than some societies. And so the, the idea of transparency is a bit foreign to us. But if you look here, we've got a, it's called a financial action task force. 
and we are not keeping up with the broader world's um, concept of how uh, how transparency should work in combating money laundering. And money laundering is really just a way to hide the proceeds of illegal activity. Um, and some of the key areas of concern are uh, certainly drug trafficking, human trafficking, some horrible things happening to people and the proceeds that come from those horrible things. There's an effort to cover those up with money laundering. And so the U.S. wants to boost its uh, ratings within FATF uh, and implementing the CTA has boosted those ratings. So the idea is now we're more credible with other governments. And why do we care? Uh, well, to the extent we want to have an even playing field, that's one reason. To the extent we want the dollar to be to continue to be the currency of international trade, that's another justification that is often advanced. So that's uh, that's sort of the policy background. And so this is a little bit of background on uh, Congress's perception of, of money laundering in general, that, um, gosh, you get to one layer of entity and then there's another entity and then another one. It's like Russian, Russian nesting dolls. We do our investigations and we just keep running into more entities. And it takes six months of discovery and subpoenas and, um, and uh, judicial orders just to get through one layer and there are infinite layers. How are we going to get through it? All these layers to find the individuals behind the entities who are using the entities to uh, to launder money. Um, <clears throat> this is, I'd say, maybe a bit of sensationalism, but this report is cited in the preamble to a, a kind of a related law that or, or proposed law that's not uh, in effect yet called the Enablers Act. But the idea here is that uh, an investigator met with 13 New York City attorneys and 12 of the 13 were uh, seemed very willing to help someone who was posing as a corrupt African official set up all kinds of entities to be able to launder, um, uh, launder funds from illegal activities in Africa. So um, there are actually some videos on the website of, of, of the undercover interviews of some of these attorneys, um, perhaps a little embarrassing for them, um, but this gives you a little bit uh, of information on the kinds of things Congress is looking at when they consider these types of laws. And then finally, the United States in the past has tended to exempt itself from having to um, deal with international money laundering that affected other countries. Uh, they, they would not require uh, US financial institutions to report or get involved if it was outside the U.S., yet um, uh, uh, the, the U.S. wouldn't do anything to help uh, foreign uh, governments with money laundering. And so that lack of reciprocity has created some reputational risk. And so um, CTA is part of trying to fix uh, some of those um, concerns as well or address some of those concerns. So the Corporate Transparency Act is administered by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. So if um, if all that other stuff didn't get your attention, the group that's in charge of this, you know, crimes is in their name. So um, that's part of the Department of Treasury. The IRS is also part of the, the Department of Treasury. And their idea is noted here. They're trying to combat money laundering, uh, terrorism financing, and then collect information that can be can help to provide um, you know, financial security or, or, or protection of the financial system. Um, it ultimately, the goal of the CTA is to find out the individuals who are behind entities that are out there. Now, there are certain exempt entities that the government doesn't think need to report for various reasons. Uh, maybe they're already highly regulated or they're particularly large entities where uh, there are enough employees and enough revenue and enough customers, et cetera, where it's unlikely they would be um, used for money laundering that would fit into an exempt entity and not have to report. But we'll get into some of that. So here's the incentive. Um, <clears throat> if you, uh, th there are both civil and criminal penalties. And so the civil penalty, uh, some of you may have heard of the $500 per day penalty. That was true in 2021. The regulations were only implemented this year, so the uh, there is an inflation adjustment every year for that civil penalty. So now it's 
at $591 per day that a violation is unremitied. There is no cap to the aggregate penalties that can be imposed for non-compliance. Um, and the reporting obligation is on what's called the reporting company, which we'll talk about what that is, but individual beneficial owners, the people who are deemed to own or control that reporting company and other parties who either won't provide information to the reporting company or try to thwart the reporting company's efforts to comply can also be subject to these penalties. So it's a very broadly drafted statute. There are lots of people who could come within the purview of the CTA and be subject to these civil fines. There are also criminal penalties uh, up to a $10,000 fine, which seems almost uh, a little silly compared to the $591 daily fine with no limit on the civil side, um, then two years in prison or both. And as noted here, the 10,000 is not a cap on the civil side. Um, that was misreported in the earlier uh, days of uh, CTA regulations coming out. So there is some enforcement uh, mechanism here um, have we been down this road before? Information reporting. Well, yes. And um, I, I, I don't like reading slides to people, so I won't read this entire thing to you, but I'll just note um, the context in the, uh, in the offshore account world, offshore entity world. We have had information for decades, information reporting for decades, um, reporting to the IRS and actually to FinCEN as well about foreign bank accounts, foreign entities. Uh, for a long time, it was voluntary information reporting. There were really not penalties. And then the government started to impose penalties because they really wanted that information reported to help them find people who were evading taxes. Uh, and they had a willful standard, just like the CTA, as they said, look, we're not going to penalize you unless the violation was willful. Well, if you fast forward um, a couple of decades, from when those penalties started, um, now willfulness is largely presumed and it's very hard for taxpayers to avoid these penalties if they violate these disclosure rules. And these are not returns that are uh, calculating or generating tax liability. They are purely informational returns, just telling the government where people's assets are. Um, so, um, what does willful mean? Can the definition of willful change over time? Yes. Um, do I have a, a grave concern the way that, that uh, FinCEN will overreach the way the IRS has uh, in some of these areas? I think that's less likely. Um, we do have some recent communication from uh, FinCEN's director noting that, look, we're not trying to make this a gotcha exercise. We're not trying to needlessly burden small businesses. We're trying to get information that we need to identify violations of law. So if we, uh, if we take what the regulators are telling us at face value and congressional intent, the civil penalties seem unlikely to be applied as do the criminal penalties unless somebody is, is thwarting the CTA in an effort to engage in some other uh, criminal activity. Um, again, that doesn't mean it can't, uh, you can't have sort of bureaucratic creep over time where the scope changes, but um, that is the represented intention. So with, uh, so with Matt, some teeth, yeah, go ahead. Pat. So I want to interrupt you a second and just ask, uh, this sounds pretty onerous. So have fines been imposed? Do you know if fines have been imposed and, and to what extent? Uh, that's a good question, Pat. So there have been no fines uh, imposed that that I'm aware of, it, the, the reporting um, just started this year. So a new entity would have to report within 30 days and an entity that pre-existed this year has until the end of this year to report. Um, uh, FinCEN is expecting about 30 million uh, entities to report this year. So it'll be very hard for them to enforce. What they have suggested, suggested is enforcement actions would only, would sort of be an outgrowth of an independent enforcement activity by, let's say the FBI or some other agency is investigating somebody uh, for certain crimes, they're gonna look and see, hey, they, we, they appear to be connected to certain entities, they file uh, their information report, 
um, or did the entity file it, et cetera. So, so, so far it appears it'll be an outgrowth of other investigations. There's no objective determination of, uh, of what somebody has to file and when that uh, the government can simply look at. They don't know that you just created a new business 30 days ago. It's a voluntary compliance system. There's, there's not a, uh, an easy audit or information sharing approach as there is in the tax space, for example, where uh, a wirehouse, you know, if you, if you have earnings in an investment account, well, they have to issue a 1099 and they send a co copy to the federal government and they have that information matching and then they know whether they should come and take a look. So it mm -hmm. would be very hard for them to initiate investigations independently. Um, this is more about information building and using in future criminal investigations and prosecutions. Okay. Um, so can I do this myself? Um, yes, the, the statute really was designed and the website has been designed to allow uh, small business owners to do it themselves. Uh, I think from looking at the way uh, the information is, is laid out and the way the website's done, I think that probably 90, 95% of uh, small businesses should be able to do all of the compliance work on their own, um, which is great. Uh, most professionals don't wanna do this. Uh, we'd like to avoid it. It's, it's, not, it's not all that exciting. It's just you know checking the box and it's compliant. Um, and so the, the website's great. There's a, uh, you, you can fill out all of the information online and enter it directly into uh, web-based forms, or you can download a very, very sophisticated PDF document fill that out and upload it later. Um, so I, I'm kind of intrigued by some of the technology they've used. They've done a nice job. There's also a small entity compliance guide. There are some FAQ or frequently asked questions documents out there. Um, there's been a lot of guidance. And so uh, FinCEN is really tr hoping to make this uh, as easy as possible. On the maybe side, can I do this myself? If you have uh, a, a larger estate uh, or a larger, more complex business with multiple, subsidi multiple subsidiaries or affiliates, irrevocable trusts, uh, multiple partners, uh, you've maybe split control and ownership in different ways. Um, it gets a little more complicated to be able to track through how all of this works. And, uh, and so we'll go through a few examples here in a minute. So I'll hit a few key terms that we'll use throughout the presentation here. And this is the way you'll see a lot of these uh, out, out in the community as well. Uh, beneficial owner or the BO, they're the uh, individual who is supposed to be disclosed. Uh, beneficial owner information report, BOIR, that's what's filed with FinCEN. Company applicant, that is the, with typically the attorney and the uh, maybe the corporate filing service that actually file the initial uh, documents like articles of incorporation for a new corporation. Uh, reporting company is the entity that is required to file uh, the BOIR, and that's where we'll focus a lot of our analysis. An exempt entity is an entity that is technically a reporting company, but they have some sort of exemption where they don't have to file the BOIR. And then the finally, the FinCEN ID that removes some of the reporting burdens because uh, the beneficial owner or the reporting company, uh, both of them, can get a, uh, a FinCEN ID assigned. And then anytime the BO has to be disclosed, they don't have to have all of their personal information go to a different reporting company and you know, be uploaded to the website. They just provide their FinCEN ID. FinCEN already has that information and it's it's very streamlined i have a fincen id it took me about five minutes to get it um i have the power to remove and replace trustees of various irrevocable trusts that own operating businesses and uh, it, it, that triggers certain disclosure requirements so um <clears throat> i uh, i will appear uh, in lots of places on the fincen database um so this is just a sample of the uh, PDF version of the BOIR. So this is the cover sheet. Um, one thing to note is you cannot leave fields blank. Um, that is, you know, in, in my mind, one of the more 
frustrating pieces. There was a, a House bill introduced to allow people to leave fields blank that they couldn't answer um, because they couldn't get the information from somebody. But um, Congress uh, did not move, did not advance that. And so you can't submit this form if things are blank or you type in, I don't know, or NA, they're a bunch of uh, banned terms basically. Um, and so, uh, th but there are also incentives for beneficial owners and others to cooperate in providing information uh, to a reporting company, of course. Uh, this is part one. This is, the re this is all of the information requested for the reporting company. So fairly quick, not a lot of detail here. If it's your first time reporting, you can click uh, this box at line three to request a FinCEN identifier. And now you've got your ID and you don't have to resubmit all of this other information as part of any future filings. Part two, this is the company applicant information. This is the attorney or maybe corporate filing service that uh, prepared and filed the original uh, entity documents. Part three, this is beneficial owner information. So this is the individual who has to be disclosed. It could be an entity. Um, and you see here at box 30 or line 37, there's a checkbox for exempt entity. So if the beneficial owner of a reporting company is an exempt entity, all that you have to do for that owner is check box 37. You put the legal name of the exempt entity in box 38 and you're done. There's no FinCEN ID, there's no need for one. Um, it, the assumption is, hey, we have an exempt entity, they're uh, regulated by some other agency, they're big enough where we're not worried about it, um, et cetera. So Matt, so, we have a question yep. in the chat and mm -hmm. the, it's from Mary who says, what if the beneficial owner is not an individual? And I think you're gonna get into that later, right? Yes, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that um, in the next couple slides here. So okay. yeah, that's a good question. So the from a methodology standpoint, um, uh, is the entity a reporting company? So you need to ask that first. Um, uh, if it's a reporting company, are there any exemptions that would qualify it as an exempt entity? Um, who is a beneficial owner of the reporting company? Are there any reporting exceptions available for the beneficial owner? And then who are the company applicants? So we'll go through these uh, different points in the coming slides here. So um, an entity to, to be a reporting company at a baseline um, is um, an exempt entity could be a reporting company. It's just that they're a reporting company that qualifies for an exemption. Um, uh, so in this case, a reporting company in general is an entity that files a document with the Secretary of State or some similar office. So what is uh, key to take away from that is common law trust, the irrevocable trust that uh, many of you have likely seen or used are not considered reporting companies under uh, CTA. That could change in the future, but currently they are not considered uh, reporting companies. Um, uh, there, now you, you go down to the exempt entity uh, consideration. So let's assume you, you are an entity like a corporation LLC uh, limited partnership that files a document with the Secretary of State. So you, you, you fit the category of reporting companies in general. Well, do you have an exemption? There are 23 different categories of exemptions, uh, various uh, types of financial institution, banks, broker dealers, RIAs are included there. But in the family business context, what you'll most likely see as an exempt entity would be the large operating co company, um, a subsidiary of an exempt entity, or a nonprofit like a private foundation or a supporting organization, something along those lines, uh, and certainly a, a independent public charity as well. So going into those exemptions, what uh, we the, one of the key ones we see in the family business space is the large operating company exemption. This is where you have more than 20 full-time employees and more than $5 million in gross receipts. Um, now those gross receipts can be aggregated from subsidiaries. So uh, if you have just a million dollars in gross receipts in uh, maybe a parent entity uh, and 4 million or more 
um, in uh, subsidiaries, then all of those can be rolled up on a uh, pursuant to a consolidated income tax return and you can meet the income test. But if the parent does not have that more than 20 employees, for example, it's a uh, holding company, um, then it will not qualify um, as, for, as an exempt entity. So you've got to have that more than 20 employees um, at the actual entity level. Um, a subsidiary exemption. So now we're, instead of looking up, we're looking down, right? Um, the entity's ownership interests are controlled or wholly owned by uh, one or more exempt entities, uh, which could include, uh, would include a large operating entity. So if you have our large operating entity that has that over 5 million of revenue and over 20 employees, and it has 100% owned subsidiaries, those subsidiaries would nest underneath it and also be exempt entities. Going on to holding companies, I touched on this a couple of slides back, but uh, while the income reported on a consolidated return may help on the revenue side, it's got to have its own uh, over 20 employees. And this was addressed explicitly in comments on the regulations by FinCEN. They said, no, we're not going to uh, exempt that because it, it, uh, it frustrates some of our uh, compliance and investigation goals. So Matt, what is the logic with exempting large businesses? I don't, I don't understand that. Well, the logic is if you have more than 20 employees, you have people, uh, 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 you have uh, significant customers, you have a lot of employees uh, kind of minding the store, seeing what's going on. Um, there are substantial um, uh, reporting requirements as far as uh, filing tax returns. Um, they may be regulated industries, although that's not required uh, uh, under that exemption. Some of the other exemptions are highly regulated industries like banks um, uh, and RIAs, but they're um, it really, when what they're looking for is the more typical types of money laundering uh, activities. And so you might have substantial uh, revenue or uh, uh, going through an entity or several entities as part of a money laundering operation, but you're not likely to have more than 20 full-time employees of that operation. Um, and so that's that's kind of the rationale there. Okay, uh, makes sense. The dividing line. So who is a beneficial owner? <clears throat> and so a beneficial owner is it's defined as an individual who directly or indirectly um, has really two types of ownership or control. And these are key distinctions. And it's um, I'm going to hit on some of the distinctions between these two as we go along, um, because the, the, there are certain differentials between these that make significant differences in the outcome on certain analyses. But one is what we call the ownership prong. And that's where you own or control at least 25% of the ownership interests of a reporting company. So, it, and then the second is the substantial control prong where you exercise substantial control over a reporting company. Now, the struggle here is the ownership test has a control component but so does the substantial control test. How do we reconcile those? Well, the ownership test, when it says owns or controls at least 25% of the ownership interest, they're looking at control that comes through actual uh, or indirect ownership of entity interests, whereas substantial control prong is looking at control that comes from non-ownership, for example, being a uh, a manager of an LLC. You don't have to own LLC membership interest to be a manager. Um, so you wouldn't have ownership, but you would have substantial control. Or a senior officer in a corporation would have substantial control, even if they don't have ownership. Um, but you might have control through ownership interests if, let's say, you have a, uh, a corporation that has 99% non voting interest and 1% voting interest that 1% voting interest would be pretty much all of the control over that corporation. And then, so you'd actually kind of break it down and say, well, with this 1% voting interest, they have 100% of the control. Therefore, they're a beneficial owner under the ownership prong. 
um, uh, based on that ownership. They'd also be a, an owner under the substantial control prong, but you only need to qualify under one. So, so when I think we, you're going to ask, oh, yeah, we have ahead, a couple Pat. questions in the chat, but I think you're going to address one of them, but let me just ask the other uh, here. So this so the individual says we have a manufacturing company with over 5 million in gross sales, but our employees are held in a different company. Do we have to report both? Yeah, so that is one of the challenges uh, from a compliance standpoint is if uh, you've got to have the employees in um, uh, the actual entity to to um, qualify for that exemption as a large operating company. And so if you if the employees are elsewhere and you're leasing the employees or the, the, the operating entity is leasing the employees from a different company, um, <clears throat> you're not going to qualify as an exempt entity. Um, whether it's worth doing a corporate restructure to resolve that, I, I'm skeptical. The compliance burden here is not uh, generally terrible. It's probably easier to just comply or maybe even over comply rather than um, to a big corporate reorganization. Yeah, and we have another question in the chat about investment company pool, but I think you're going to get into that. So I'm not going to ask that right now. But I will also remind people that we should have time at the end for questions. And I know that those that registered, we had a lot of people register. Some of you have questions and we, we've got those and Matt's going to address some of those in the presentation and then we have some time at the end. So giving it back to you now, Matt. Thanks. <clears throat> So some of the slides here are, are for uh, background or supplemental information. So if you're uh, going back to your own advisors and trying to get them up to speed or you're uh, having issues with somebody not giving information or whatnot, uh, it's there to, to help give you guidance. So I'm not gonna go through every single point here, um, but this is some of the, these are some of the things to consider on the ownership prong. Um, here are some other things to consider on the substantial control Wrong. Um, so these are senior officers of an entity, or if they have the ability to remove and replace senior officers, this could be uh, applicable to trustees or a power to remove trustees, as we'll see below. Uh, if they're generally an important decision maker, there's even a catch-all provision that is extremely broad, um, even going down to the bottom saying any contract arrangement, understanding, relationship, or otherwise. So very, very broad. Um, this is where things can get a little bit hazy in a more complex corporate structure because you have to figure out, okay, well, what, what does all of this mean? Um, it, and, and it's really a fact-specific analysis. So there are five exceptions to a beneficial owner. So let's say you qualify under those tests above as the beneficial owner, but you may still not have to uh, be disclosed on the reporting company's beneficial owner information report or BOIR. <clears throat> um, if you're a minor child, well, your parent or guardian is actually the beneficial owner. If you're an agent uh, or a custodian, so the government does not want to know who is holding interest in an LLC on behalf of somebody else. They don't care who the custodian is because the custodian doesn't own it. And it's oftentimes custodians or agents who are holding those entity interests on behalf of some sort of criminal element. And so uh, that's, that's not going to um, do the trick. They want to know the actual individual who has uh, ownership, not their uh, represent, representatives that are kind of in between. Um, an employee who is not a senior officer of a reporting company is not a going to be a beneficial owner. However, there can be employees, routinely are employees of exempt entities that are beneficial owners because of substantial control. And this tends to throw people for a loop. I've had some corporate trustees uh, uh, debate me on, on this, uh, uh, at least preliminarily until they start digging into the regulations and they realize, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, our, our trust officers, even though we're an exempt entity, our trust officers have uh, substantial control and therefore have to be disclosed as beneficial owners. And so it's a little counterintuitive. Just keep in mind, uh, exempt entity does not cleanse everything. If there's substantial control, the government wants an individual at the end of that line, not an exempt entity, uh, not any kind of entity. 
Uh, future inheritance, if it's just an expectancy interest, you're not a beneficial owner. Uh, if you're a creditor who might have a collateral interest in some sort of entity uh, you might foreclose on, that's just a potential future foreclosure. You don't have a, you're not considered a beneficial owner, even though you could maybe take those assets in foreclosure uh, after a default. Uh, company applicants, this is just a one-time thing. Whoever formed the company, it's usually the attorney who might have drafted some of the documents and then maybe a uh, filing service. There are only, there can only be two uh, or there can be no more than two. There could be one. Um, this is an act of legislative grace or so the legislature tells us uh, because initially they were going to make you go all the way back in time to figure out who the heck formed each entity which for older entities would be really, really difficult. So fortunately, uh, now we only have to do it on a go forward basis. So these examples coming up here, some of these are right out of, you can see at the bottom, this, the uh, FinCEN's uh, small entity compliance guide. <clears throat> I flipped it around because I think it's easier to understand things if the owners are at the top of the um, illustration, but you'll be able to see these examples in uh, FinCEN's own publications. And then in some cases I created my own examples um, either based on these or that I created from scratch, but you'll anywhere where it's modeling something from the FinCEN uh, small entity or small entity compliance guide, uh, I have a reference at the bottom of the slide. So in this case, we have a fairly straightforward example. It's direct ownership. Um, and substantial control. So we have individual A owns 100% of A corporation. They're also the president and they make important decisions. So they're a beneficial owner in two ways, substantial control and because they own 25% or more of A corp. Uh, example 1A, so I, uh, I, I, I created my own example that changes the facts a little bit. <clears throat> and I said, well, wait a minute. And, and actually this was a, a topic I just got a, a, an email from a uh, family office in-house counsel on this this morning. Um, what if we have one spouse? So, so let's say individual A and B are married. Uh, one spouse has the stock in their name, 100% individual A here, uh, but individual B, when they're married, it's community property. They're deemed to at least constructively own 50%, does that mean we have to report them as a second beneficial owner? Well, I think, um, yes, that is one theory that could support the need to report both individual A and B as beneficial owners. If we look at example 1B, I think the more, <clears throat> um, the more accurate answer, um, and this is, um, it, uh, out of the, I've got a regulation site here uh, that backs this up. The more accurate answer is that when they hold the assets as community property, it's not the fact that we assume they own assets 50 50, because here, if we assume the interest, uh, the ownership interest of individual A dropped from 100% down to 40%, um, you know, well, wait a minute, if we split this 2020 between individual A and individual B, neither one of them is a beneficial owner, right? Well, no, because community property, and, and I'm in a community property state in California, um, you know, we only have nine, so we're in the minority, but there are other types of marital property, tenancy by the entirety, et cetera, in other jurisdictions that are probably similar as far as how this goes. And in the uh, CTA regulations, if one spouse owns uh, 40%, uh, or if each spouse owns 20%, uh, but they own it as what's called an undivided ownership interest, uh, they basically are attributed to each other. So in this case, both spouses would be deemed to own 40% because of this undivided uh, interest uh, concept. And so it, it's so just keep in mind when you're dealing with marital property, you, you do not want to assume uh, that a 40% ownership by one spouse would be divided between them as 20%. Actually, it causes both of them to be deemed as owning 40%, which would mean both have to be disclosed as beneficial owners. 
uh, so example. We have a couple. Of, oh, we have, let me mm -hmm. have some questions. I know you have a lot more slides to get through. So um, we have a, one question is, does the custodial question also apply to trustees of trusts? Uh, maybe you're going to get into that. If you are, then we'll just let you get into that. Um, and yeah. then they, there's a question on our holding company holds two RIA companies, but does not have over 20 employees and it's privately owned by approximately 400 shareholders, none of which owns 25% or more of the ownership interest would the holding company entity need to file? I think we're going to have a lot of these kind of questions. Yeah. So a holding company that owns two exempt entities, <clears throat> so those entities don't have to report, but the holding company is not an exempt entity. Um, it would, it, so it is a reporting company um, uh, as, as a non-exempt entity. Um, as far as owners, so, so you have two tests, right? There's the ownership test and the control test or substantial control test um, with 400 shareholders. Yeah, nobody's, well, and it's represented, nobody owns at the 25% or more. So you don't have to disclose a beneficial owner under the ownership test, but somebody or probably several somebodies have substantial control, at least the CEO, president, um, uh, manager, if it's an LLC, uh, the holding company has substantial control and that person would have to be disclosed as the beneficial owner uh, of the holding company as a as a non-exempt entity. Um, as to the question about trusts versus custodians, trusts are very different from custodians, so custodians are ignored. Um, trusts are, <clears throat> uh, well, trusts are not reporting companies, but you focus on the trustee, um, generally of the trust, uh, sometimes the beneficiaries as well, but we'll get into that in a little bit here. Okay, so one last question is, mm -hmm. as corporate trustees, can the beneficial owner, can be, as as corporate trustees, can the beneficial owner, what is it, what if it's an administrative corporate trustee that cannot perform duties without direction? Not sure I understand that. Yeah, that's a directed trust uh, question. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit when we get to trust. Okay. Um, that's one area that there's some debate. So, um, mm -hmm. um, so this is this example here is out of the um, the small entity compliance guide. I'm going to skip this one because it's more straightforward. Um, we've had some good questions. I want to just give people a little more <clears throat> uh, detail. You can see here in example three, we have separate ownership. So we've got individuals here who are be beneficial owners because of ownership, but individual C is just the manager of the LLC here. They don't have ownership, but they have substantial control and therefore uh, they have to be disclosed as a um, uh, beneficial owner. Um, even though they're sharing managerial duties with individual A, it's still sufficient to trigger that uh, substantial control uh, element. Um, individual, or excuse me, example four is indirect ownership. And so now we're getting down to multiple entities um, and so forth. So just keep in mind, we're assuming here company Y and Z are not exempt entities. Um, and so, but, but we're not really focused too much on those. So don't worry about what they do or don't report. We're focusing on what does a corporation, which is the reporting company, uh, have to report uh, we, and we have an individual over here who makes important decisions. All right. Now, I'm definitely not going to read every last detail to you here, but it's just key to note that we have individuals um, who are beneficial owners through ownership. Um, and you can see the math here on the side. You know, you're multiplying. Um, well, we've got 70% of the stock of company Y times 50% of the stock of A corporation. Of course, that's 35%. That uh, takes us over the 25% plus limit. We have individual F who directs important decisions through board representation. Um, they So they have uh, substantial control in that case. Um, if it's a, a board of, let's say, five people, they probably do have substantial control. If it's a board of 20 people, perhaps they don't. There is not yet clear guidance on where the dividing line is, but there is some implication from FinCEN that there is a dividing line. Uh, they're just not sure where it is. And uh, hopefully we'll find out soon. Um, 
So this is uh, indirect ownership again, um, just keeping in mind that now we have assumed that company Y and company Z are exempt entities. And so what that means is um, we, uh, we, we're in a position where um, we, some of these people will not have to be uh, reported as beneficial owners um, as a result of uh, the, the sheltering of the exempt entity. Um, I'm gonna uh, jump past these two are, this is uh, more like a 101 version. I left these in here or put these in here for people to take to their individual advisors as far as can you report the FinCEN ID of an intermediate entity that is not exempt? Uh, this is not in the FinCEN materials, but it is in the regulations and I have not found anything published on it yet. I just put it here for your reference or your advisor's reference if you find it helpful at some point in the future, um, but it's a little more complex. Um, this is more of a comprehensive example. I'm gonna skip this in favor of going into trust in a little more detail. Uh, uh, all the answers are below. So getting into trust, just note that common law trusts are never reporting companies, so they will never file a beneficial owner information report under current uh, CTA. Instead, we're focusing on trustees. So we have example seven, and this is trust ownership where we have aggregation across trust. So we have generation one, which is the parents, generation two, the kids. So we got three kids. Each of their irrevocable trust has 10% of the stock. Um, parents have 70% of the stock. So the parents would be beneficial owners in that context. The individual trustee, you have to aggregate the 10% stock in each of these trusts and then apply it to the individual trustee. And so they are treated as having 30% so the individual trustee has to be reported as a beneficial owner in that instance, even though the trusts themselves are not uh, actually reporting companies. Um, if you uh, put a corporate trustee in here, um, you say, okay, now <clears throat> we have a corporate trustee. How does the reporting change? Well, with a corporate trustee, I'm assuming here that they are an exempt entity, which is generally correct, although not always true. Um, in this case, the, uh, the we have the 30% aggregation again, but it's only through ownership that this corporate trustee is deemed to own a corporation, not through control. As a result, they can shelter under the exempt entity uh, umbrella and uh, a corporation simply discloses the corporate trustee uh, you know, checks the exempt entity box, says corporate trustee, or whatever, whatever the corporate trustee's name is, and that's all they have to report as to the corporate trustee. Of course, they also have to report G1 or generation one as a beneficial owner. If you go to the example 7B, what I've done here is I said, okay, now let's put the trustee in control. We took uh, generation one down to 40% interest and generation two in the aggregate has a 60% interest, which means they have enough to uh, vote board of directors, um, vote the stock related to uh, sale, um, dissolution, et cetera. And so now you have a corporate trustee that not, not only has 25% uh, or more from an ownership standpoint, but they also have a substantial control position and this is a key distinction uh, and note at the bottom, the individual trust officer working for the tr corporate trustee for this particular client of the trustee is has a substantial control and it is that person who needs to be disclosed. Even though the corporate trustee is an exempt entity, you have a substantial control party who needs to be disclosed. Most corporate trustees, including going back to that question we got a little bit ago, including those that work there or that mostly operate in, in the directed trust context where there are third parties like a trusted uh, or an investment advisor or a distribution advisor telling them what to do. Uh, even those trustees acting mostly in an administrative capacity for the most part will require their trust officers to have a FinCEN ID and to disclose it to uh, their, their customers or clients who have 
uh, that reporting obligation or whose, whose entities have that reporting obligation. Some have done some restructures where they say, look, we don't want our individual trust officers doing this. We're going to strip some of their powers and give it to one person in the institution. Um, there's some ambiguity about whether that truly works, but um, there are some doing that, but most are uh, sharing the FinCEN ID of their specific trust officers. Um, so uh, one other item here, and then I want to jump back into some questions and answers and we can, uh, there's some, uh, a lot of the balance of the slides are, are, are sort of takeaway resources. Um, just trust ownership where there are third party uh, beneficial owners. In this case, um, <clears throat> you can see generation one only has 10% of the stock. They're not otherwise a beneficial owner, but this, in this case, the generation one has what's called the power of substitution, which is a very common power used in grantor irrevocable trusts. The fact that they are able to swap assets with the trust puts them in a position where they would have to be disclosed as a beneficial owner. We also have a trust protector over here, uh, and it's represented that the trust protector has the power to remove and replace the individual trustee. The individual trustee here on an aggregate basis owns 90% of the stock via these three trusts and is therefore, therefore has substantial control. Um, and so, although not everybody would necessarily agree with this, I believe the trust protector having the power to remove the individual trustee who has substantial control also has substantial control and should be disclosed. Um, I don't tend to serve as a trust protector, I, but I do serve as in a role where I can remove and replace trustees. Um, and anywhere I have that power and there's a, a reporting company involved, I provide uh, I provide the reporting company with my FinCEN ID so that they can uh, include me as a beneficial owner on their uh, on their BOIRs. So Matt, we had a question earlier about, can you discuss the exemption for an investment company or a pooled investment vehicle? And what should those companies vehicle look like? Many family businesses have investment partnerships. Uh, yes. So I'll just, I'll go down to private trust companies because that's, that's not exactly on point, but that's a similar, uh, concept. So there are a variety of entities that are exempt, uh, where a family may have substantial control over a highly regulated entity. Um, just because the entity is highly regulated or regulated, uh, let me restate that. Just because the entity is regulated doesn't mean it's sufficiently regulated to fit in to an exempt entity category. So that the unfortunately the answer to that question is typical lawyer answer. It depends. That's one of those tougher analyses where you have to say, okay, yes, you're regulated. Are you regulated within the specific um, confines that uh, that the CTA has set forth for exemption? And it's a long list. There's a ton of details. I can't answer it with any specificity here, but I would just say uh, one example is private trust companies. They are regulated. Uh, I would uh, imagine most of them are not regulated to such a level that they would not be required to support, uh, to report uh, or file a BOIR. Um, and, and those that are regulated enough to not have to file a BOIR, they're already providing that information to uh, maybe to FinCEN, maybe to the SEC, um, other um, other government entities, so that you know CTA compliance would not be terribly um, difficult in that case. We also have a question: Is do charitable family foundations have to report? I mean, that's so foundations are not for profits, so do they have to report? Yeah, private foundation fits within. So that's uh, down here. I added some detail because the regulations are drafted a little confusingly, but um, yeah, if you're a nonprofit, even if you're a brand new nonprofit and all you have done is file your 1023 initial uh, application for exemption with the IRS, so you, you're, you're not recognized as, um, uh, as exempt, um, you, are, uh, you are exempt, you are considered an exempt entity under CTA. Um, if you later, you know, if you don't get your exempt status from the IRS, um, that could be a problem. If you lose your exempt status, you have 180 days to 
uh, to comply at that time. But a, a private family foundation would be exempt even if they have not yet filed that exemption application. They may have just filed their articles, articles of incorporation uh, with the state secretary of state. Maybe they have some bylaws. They're working on their exemption application, but just haven't gotten it done. So you're you're in good shape. Okay, and this this last question is: What about a private trust company replacing the corporate or individual trustee in your example seven A? Yeah, so it, it going back uh, in, in example seven A, if we have a private trust company jump in here, um, the question is: Are they an exempt entity or not? Um, I am skeptical about a lot of private trust companies being exempt entities. Um, if it's a broader family net worth of maybe 500 million or more, uh, maybe they are at a compliance level where they, they can, uh, uh, or they're so highly regulated that they would fit within that exempt entity definition. Um, if they did, then they would have the same rules as a corporate trustee, except that um, uh, uh, you, you, and this gets into some of the uh, ambiguities on corporate trustees in general, um, it's possible because you probably have fewer shareholders of a private trust company. It's possible one or more of the shareholders could be a beneficial owner um, through uh, not, not under the uh, ownership test, as long as the uh, private trust company is, is indeed an exempt entity may, but perhaps the, the substantial control test. You want to keep an eye out for that. Um, and that's actually addressed in FinCEN. It's called Frequent Asked Questions or FAQD period 16. Um, um, and so there's that's actually detailed in the slides here, but and referenced as well. If it's not an exempt entity, <clears throat> then um, because of the uh, presumed fewer shareholders of the corporate trustee, or excuse me, of the private trust company, um, you would probably have to disclose the individual shareholders as beneficial owners to the extent anybody owns 25% uh, or more of the private trust company, or uh, it, you know, including constructively via trusts and so forth, uh, or uh, the substantial control element, of course, uh, would be at play as well. So I want to let everyone know that there is a PDF document that will be sent around to everyone that registered for this call today, uh, probably be sent around from John Gugliana. So look for that in the next day or so. Also, um, we do take this, this webcast, as you know, it's being recorded and it will be on our Family Enterprise USA YouTube channel. So there was a lot that Matt shared with us today. Uh, it's obviously a much more complicated subject than most people really understood, certainly me. And um, there's a lot to learn. So uh, I really encourage you, you may wanna watch it again, uh, again on our YouTube channel. So I wanna thank Matt Brown, who obviously is an expert in CTA. Uh, and I'm sure you're gonna get a lot of questions via email, <laughs> Matt. So Happy thank answer. you so much for doing this. It was a really fantastic, presentation and we really appreciate your time and, and all the effort you put into this presentation today. Well, thanks, Pat. Thanks, everybody. And uh, also thank you for your support of Family Enterprise USA. We really appreciate the sponsorship of Brown and Strazo. So everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining. Take care. Bye-bye.